uh, I'm Chi Sun, the moderator for the panel discussion this afternoon. Uh, I will do a quick introduction first, right? Uh, the panel discussion for this afternoon will be the Federated Data Platform on Tropical Biodiversity. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, 80% of the world's biodiversity are in the tropics. Data on these biodiversities come from the university, research institution, individuals, and uh, non-governmental organization. The existence of a data platform that links these various resources will greatly multiply their individual value. Okay, keeping this in mind, uh, all my panelists here, uh, the aim of our discussion today is to discuss on the way forward in consolidating different databases under the Malaysia Open Science Platform. Malaysia Open Science Platform, or known as MOSP, is a national initiative championed by the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. The aim to set up a platform to enable the data sharing for all the Malaysians' research data set. Okay, so today uh, we will have three eminent panelists that will be share with us their experience in capturing the data and also uh, consolidating under different platform. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, so today uh, we have uh, Dr. Lilian uh, Chua Suilian with us. Good afternoon, Dr. Lilian. And Mr. Lawrence Livermore, all the way from London. Uh, we have another panelist is joining us in a minute. It's Mr. Lin, Mr. Lin Kui Fong. He's rebooting the this is right. Okay. All right. Uh, I think we can start with uh, Dr. Lilian first. Okay, so let me introduce our first panelist today. Uh, Dr. Lilian Charles Lilian obtained her PhD in conservation biology from the University of Bath, UK in 1997, studying an endemic species of Ephanthus pitcherplant as her research subject. In her 25 years of service as a researcher in the Forest Research Institute Malaysia, the Frick, she has authored more than 90 articles and papers in the field of botany and conservation biology. As part of the research, she provides technical help to stakeholders on matters related to species and habitat conservations. And she's a member of the World Conservation Union Global Tree Specialist Group. And she's currently holding the positions of the Directors of Biodiversity Divisions in Freight. So today, we, she will be sharing with us on the Malaysia Biodiversity Information Systems, the MIPIS. Uh, without further ado, I would like to pass the sessions to Dr. Lillian to begin her presentation. Dr. Lillian. Thank you very much, Dr. Liu. Um, I hope I'm clear. Yes, uh, loud and clear. Thank you, thank you. Uh, welcome everyone to this session. I'd like to share with you a snapshot of what, the, um, what we do with the vast biodiversity information that uh, we, coll we collate and are rather scattered. Okay, so, um, I'd like to start with my slideshow. Okay, um, this is merely a snapshot. So if anyone who is more interested in the information, could you visit this MyBase website that is given uh, on board here, yeah? Now, as you know, Malaysia is one of the 17 mega diverse countries in the world. Um, and what is presented here are merely uh, some of the selected statistics, the ones that uh, we have more confident in. Of course, we do have, um, and I'll touch on it shortly, for the vascular plants, we have an estimated 15,000. Yeah. Um, in the past 10 years or so, we have uh, been publishing about 150 new species and there are probably a lot more that is waiting to be discovered out there for our vascular plant species. These are, these are the statistics for Malaysia, yeah? so co uh, comprising both Sabah and Sarawak. Now for the world of fungi, we have more than, uh, on the twin, we have more than 4,000 over species and as usual, uh, a lot more new species are popping out. Um, from the Mammals data, uh, this is a little bit more stable. We have 306 species of mammals. And 
for birds, we have about 400, uh, 742. And uh, when it comes down to reptiles, reptiles and amphibians, again, these are merely estimates. Uh, 567 species of reptiles and 242 species of amphibians. Yes, a lot more uh, niche species of reptiles and amphibians are still on the are still being discovered. Uh, these numbers, I think uh, you should be able to get them from the Sixth National Report to the Convention on Biological Diversity. You go to the CBD website and you draw out the Malaysia report for the, for the Sixth National Report for Malaysia. Yeah. Um, coming to the fishes, we have freshwater fish, 449. And the, and the marine fish, a thousand, more than 1,619. And the insects, the whole huge big world of insects, more than 150,000 species. Now, this number refers to species numbers. Yeah? These are not specimen numbers. So, and these are like, uh, a, a, with the exception of mammals and birds, okay, it is very uh, dynamic. Um, and um, yeah, simply vast. Of course, of course, we are not sure whether we some of the species are still available, whether the populations are still available in Malaysia. But if it is uh, derived from specimen collection, then uh, what they call latest specimen collection, then of course the populations will be still extend. So um, as as you can see, what I provide here is merely a snapshot of certain taxonomic groups, yes. We have no reliable data for other taxonomic groups such as gastropods, crustaceans, hard corals, and many others, right? We have no reliable data. There are some pockets here and there, but they are uh, quite uh, within specific groups of these larger uh, taxonomic groups. So, now, Malaysia has this policy. Yeah? I'll try to relate what we are doing here with my bees with what uh, we needed to uh, harness within our national policy on biological diversity. We have five goals. As you can see, this is a 2016 to 2025 policy. It's, uh, it's an ongoing policy. We have five goals of here. And what I'll, I'm now showing you two goals of which my bees is extremely relevant. Um, and goal, the first goal is uh, we have empowered harness commitment. Now, to be able to you know, harness commitment, we needed to get target one, right? More Malaysians are aware of the values of biodiversity. In our 2019 uh, research work, yeah, uh, looking, at, uh, uh, looking at the baseline understanding of biodiversity in Malaysia, uh, looking at four components, one, one of which is the, pu the, the public, yeah, discovered that 91% of the respondents, this and, and the respondents uh, survey sample, we use the Department of Statistics methods, 91% of the respondents have Poor understanding of the biodiversity in Malaysia, ninety-one percent. Okay, so this goes, this goes to show that we have, we have a fairly long way more to to meet uh, target one. Um, so and in goal five. It says we have improved the capacity and knowledge of all stakeholders to conserve biodiversity. Uh, the target which is related to we need to have knowledge and science-based related biodiversity values, not, not just species diversity, but the functioning of the species within its ecosystems, status trends to be improved and applied. Okay, so um, so the reason being, the reason being is that uh, the scientific basis for decision making needs to be enhanced further in this country. That is certain. There is a clear need for a coherent science policy interface 
to guide decision making both at the federal level and state level and at policy, legislative, and implementation levels. Right. So we it is it is a real big job, uh, but uh, we believe that making the fundamental information available uh, that should pave the way for the improving science policy interface. Um, we have three other goals in the policy, which is not, which is um, which is indirectly related to my BIS. So if you if you all would like to have a look at this policy, I think it's, it is available on the my BIS website. Now let's go to what my BIS is all about. My BIS stands for Malaysia Biological Information Systems, right? And my BIS is a repository for Malaysia's biodiversity databases. Okay, we began in uh, 2008 and uh, now we are already into our phase three and um, there is uh, development over phases but phase one we look at because we, we know from a previous study, uh, feasibility study or scoping study on natural history collections in Malaysia we, we knew and we understood that the, we do have, we have a fair amount of the uh, information on databases, a uh, fair amount of information on biological diversity, but these are residing in specimens and uh, they are not yet at that time, uh, uh, what do you call, in uh, uh, digital formats. So it is important that we needed to be able to serve target one and target 16, we needed to get things going. So that was phase one. Then we, in 2010, we entered phase two, where we, be, uh, we became more focused on to how the information uh, reaches the public. Okay. So we were looking at uh, incorporation of smart features, and we were looking at uh, in order to facilitate public access, yeah, and uh, to meet national aspirations, and also to reach our scientific and reach our scientific data, and in in that way, we had to also go out and include other taxa group. Uh, in the past slides, I had already informed that um, there was just selected statistics. There were a lot of other taxas that are not uh, within our immediate reach. And uh, phase two was, was trying to uh, go into that direction, right? And of course, uh, we also needed to enhance the capacity and the quality of our existing databases, okay? Um, as, as for phase three now, we are into phase three now, we are, del uh, we are more into easing, enhancing the ease of use, right? Uh, as... as uh, in other words, how to use the massive amount of all these databases allow the public and decision makers to analyze and you know whatever information that we needed to uh, understand the context of cons conservation and allow decision making. Okay, this is what. Um, this is what the homepage of my base would look like. So it will allow you all to discover by species, specimens, photo structure, uh, explore the spatial, the spatial uh, details, and also to analyze. And there is a uh, what do you call module on references, right? Now for the species. We have, my base is currently holding about 47,500 species records, right? So this one comprises both native and non-native species. And species also uh, co co comprises, like I said just now, the flora, fauna, um, uh, the fungi, okay, and several others. Then we have by specimens, which we hold about a hundred. My base uh, application holds about a hundred and ten thousand species. Now, there are a lot more here. You see, because uh, we 
the databases that the rest of the databases, this is merely a subset, yeah. The rest of the databases are being held by respective institutions. Okay, I will show you who are our current collaborators in the next slide. And these this information such as specimen details and images are all available there. So you go into the specimen module and then you click. If you're interested in the holdings of a certain organization or agency, then you go down and click there and you can see all the specimens and images. Um, my bees does not actually have, uh, do not hold all those kind of data. It's just, it's just merely being uh, linked, right? And in uh, my bees, uh, we have about 10,250 10, uh, photographs or images and in protected areas we have 521 localities which means that it covers of course you know protected areas uh, state parks um, wildlife sanctuaries amenity forests virgin jungle reserves down to that detailness right you're talking about uh, amenity forest yeah um, and all those uh, sections like state, uh, okay, state parks, amenity forests, research forests, and etc., etc., you all find uh, the information here. Um, you can't, can, can, can you all see the references? The references here, we have about 556. Yes, sir. I'm not sure whether you all can see because the screen appears to be blocking. 556. Uh, experts, experts here, which are which are actual biodiversity experts here. They can be taxonomists, ecologists, uh, chemists, or, uh, or what they call more. Uh, at, and those working at the molecular level. Then we have literature. 2,571 literatures, yeah? These numbers here, and then we have one last one, which is a uh, database on common stroke vernacular names, both local and uh, vernacular names that are used by uh, large local communities, basically. So we have about 19,000, 19, close to 20,000 uh, numbers. And this, as you can see, these numbers here will are dynamic and they will change from time to time yeah now this is the snapshot of our current collaborators uh, i think i won't go into too much details here what i would like to point out we do have a collaboration with natural history museum of london right on which i believe uh, mr lawrence afterwards will be presenting uh, it. And then uh, we we uh, we we have the Wallace's collection, Albert Wallace's collection, uh, based here. And because um, more than ninety five percent of Wallace's collection are, are done in um, in Malaysia and also the Malay archipelago. So therefore, you know, uh, we did the link of his collections back to my this is. Uh, super important, yeah. Now, what is the way forward for my bees? In the fourth, in the next few years, we will we will be thinking along these directions. Okay. Now, re uh, recall back the fact that I mentioned just now, ninety-one percent of Malaysians have poor understanding, and you know, being the uh, this is a is an internet of the IT era, where a large percentage of this 91% are also, you know, coming from the younger groups. So it is it is uh, very crucial that we enhance the user experiences of my base here. Yeah? So these are the some of the areas in which we would think of improving ease of use and navigation, responsiveness, and we are also to enhance further my piece, we'll be adding new modules such as germplasm collections, germplasm living collections, as well as those in the field and those in seed banks, etc. And we're also looking into citizen science as a means of uh, meeting our target one of our national policy, right? Uh, along, along the way, 
uh, we will be developing, uh, working in tandem with uh, developing uh, new applications, right? Um, behind the scenes, of course, it is, it is very important that we need to enrich our information databases and, of course, architecture. That is why uh, we will be looking at uh, potential collaborators, those that we know uh, have um, specimen databases, especially specimen databases, because when, when very frequently uh, institutes with specimen da databases, they will also have image uh, databases, yeah? Um, and uh, every now and then we will ensure data integrity. And this is all necessary yeah, because we are very keen to meet our target one and target 16 of our national policy on biological diversity. Thank you. Dr. Liu, I think I return back the session to you. Thank you, Dr. Li Diet. Thank you for sharing with us the remarkable MIP system. Next speaker, speakers we have, our next panelist is Mr. Lin Kui Fung. Okay, Mr. Lin. Uh, Lin Kui Fung has been involved in the web technologies development for nature and conservation studies since 1998. And in biomathematics, Lin and his team have worked on taxonomy systems architecture and are involved in large-scale R&D and interactive web technologies for the scientific research community. And in 2017 and 2018, Lim was involved in the country pioneering effort to digitize the Alfred Borlas collections uh, from the Natural History Museum London. So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Lim uh, for his presentations. So Lim, the session is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Liu. Thank you for your introduction. Okay, so my session basically uh, is to share my experience in... Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. It's a shame my experience uh, that um, in bringing back our natural history, uh, natural uh, heritage from the Natural History Museum way back in uh, 2017. Uh, it's a, a collaboration between uh, Ecomai and the project is sponsored by Yasan Hassana and the Natural History Museum. Okay. So the project is called Bringing Back Malaysia's Natural Heritage from the NHM. All right. And uh, this project, uh, the genesis of this project actually you know, um, occurred way back in 1998, together with the Professor Ghazali Ismail, who was then the Deputy Vice Chancellor of UNIMAS. We went to the NHM okay, on our own, <laughs> using our own personal funds to visit the, the, um, the then uh, Director of Science, Professor Paul Henderson. And um, we had an understanding to digitize the Malaysian collection then but because of the Asia financial crisis, uh, the whole project was shelved. And we had to wait almost 20 years, all right? 20 years. In June 14, uh, 2017, Yayasan Hasana uh, have agreed to fund the project to digitize the, those Malaysian collections and uh, specifically the Alfred uh, R. Wallace collection. Um, we worked together with the NGO called Ecomai uh, for the project. And uh, after signing the, the agreement with Yasan Hassana, I, was, I went to the NHM and the picture on the right, and you will be able to see Mr. Lawrence Livermore, who will be presenting after me afterwards. All right. We signed the MOU about a month after that, and the project commenced thereafter. So basically, um, what was this project all about? Now, to, to bring back the uh, content from the NHM, we needed to build a database, all right? And we call this uh, database the Atlas of Living Malaysia. This uh, Atlas of Living Malaysia, or ALAM, is actually uh, uh, very closely following the, um, the system developed by the Atlas of Living Australia, which was built by the CSIRO. And uh, the NHM advises to follow the structure because uh, it is, it is well proven and it works for Australia. And uh, uh, Malaysia being a very rich in terms of biodiversity, okay, one of the top 13 uh, my, uh, uh, most biodiverse country in the world, uh, NHM feels that the, the uh, Atlas of Living Australia model was suitable for us. So we agreed and then that's how Atlas of Living Malaysia came about. The, um, a quick briefly, very briefly, uh, how ALAM is structured. We, it is developed based on the Darwin Core open source system. 
Um, the Darwin Core is uh, standards are basically designed to facilitate an exchange of information about the geographic occurrence of species and existence of specimens in collection. Um, this, this, info, this kind of information are very relevant to museum communities and natural history collections, all right? What they have done is that basically they have already the structure to, to, to uh, categorize um, specimen data based on standards that have been already agreed by key institutions all around the world, okay? So by having this Darwin core standard as uh, the core of the alarm, we are basically plugging onto an international based standard. We do not need to reinvent the view, okay? So NHM basically have done us a great favor by transferring technology to us and uh, creating this system. So the commonly used um, uh, information stored using any uh, Darwin core open source systems uh, species occurrence data, and the basic unit is the record. So basically every specimen, all right, every specimen recorded has its own uh, URL. Uh, that is required uh, uh, in the system. And basically that defines the, uh, the, what call this, the copyright of the specimen hosted in the particular museum or collection center. Next. Um, Fairly quickly, the Darwin Core uh, actually uh, hosts a glossary of terms. They have all these uh, property elements, uh, properties, elements, fields, um, which are intended to facilitate the sharing of information, information about biological diversity, right? By providing reference definitions, examples, and commentaries. Now, the, the data is based primarily on taxa, and more importantly, the occurrence in nature um, and documented by observations. Now the information stored in such a facility is pretty rich, all right? It can be uh, anything from uh, the geographical location, right up to even the DNA analysis. So it's very, very rich. It depends on the user, how they key in the information and what kind of information gets stored into the system, all right? And uh, it not just only stores the system, it has documentation that describes how the terms are managed and how the set of terms can be extended for new purposes and how the terms can be used. Uh, basically, what we are saying is that the Darwin core is scalable. It's not something that is done now and then it becomes a legacy issue. It's not. It's scalable. It, uh, it, can, it can be uh, you know, retrofitted to, to meet future expectations. So ALAM is based on that and I think uh, we have something that is pretty scalable and uh, uh, a bit future-proof, I would say. Okay. Now, when we, build, when we were building ALAM, uh, NHM help us to transfer quite a bit of technology, all right? Thanks to Lawrence Limomo and his team. Uh, they help us by understanding programming conventions, not just the uh, technology side, but also the biological side. So combining these two, um, we have a very good um, understanding of actually how uh, biological data, you know, gets stored in the physical IT systems, okay? More importantly, we got to understand global standards biota how they were organized and how the, the, the structures are developed so that uh, it can be integrated into the Global Biodiversity Information Facility or GBIF. Uh, for, for your uh, what this, uh, understanding, uh, GBIF is basically the standard where all these uh, biota are integrated and in, uh, the, the, it's interchangeable between various different, different kinds of systems. Okay. So that at the end of the day, you have an integrated system where information can be transferred around without much problem. Malaysia, unfortunately, is not a signatory of GBIF. Okay, although we are one of the most uh, diverse, biodiverse country in the world. So I believe that ALAM, uh, which is now GBIF uh, ready, can be something that can uh, we can look into and see how we can actually use it, you know, as a learning step to get our country integrated into the GBIF community. Apart from developing a system, uh, one of the big part of the project was to digitize the Malaysian and the Alfred Wallace collection, which is held at the NHM. Now you can see over here, this slide, the process of digitizing, okay? Um, the NHM personnel helped us to actually source for the material stock in their inventory. Most of it are uh, insects, okay? And this is basically the process 
of digitizing is a very, very uh, time consuming, very manually based uh, process. And I'm happy that, you know, the quality has been astounding, really very good. I will show you some example of the type of quality that we managed to get from the NHM. Before I go to the quality, this is uh, basically the, uh, the website for Alam. For those of you interested, please go to this uh, the, the, uh, domain here, okay? Um, listed in red, alam.org.my slash prototype. The site is not launched yet, not officially launched yet. Um, just go to this prototype site and you'll be able to play around with all the links, okay? And, uh, and you can actually visit all the specimen that we have digitized from the NHM. What did we bring back from NHM? We brought back 21,037 images of Malaysian species. And um, when we brought it home, it, was, it is currently stored in a local cloud a virtual private network, okay? Under the domain, alam.org of mine. Uh, out of these 21,000 images, 5,000 of it are, are considered as Wallace type specimen. The Wallace type specimen is an important collection because it describes many of the type specimen used to identify new species. So now Malaysian researchers do not need to go to the Natural History Museum to open drawers and actually look at this specimen. They can actually refer to Alam uh, and, then, and then look for the spe specimen and actually do research from there, especially taxonomy research, okay? Um, I, I'll show you the example of, uh, so this is the, an example of a digitized image of a beetle family from the Elatiridae uh, family, they call it Agoniscus Lugulatus. It's only one centimeter, you know, one centimeter long, this particular beetle. And uh, this is a quality that the NHM has given us. We can even zoom in, and this is the quality that we're looking at, okay? So basically, researchers do not need to go to the NHM. They can just come to this site and actually look out for the specimen that which they want to uh, identify and then do taxonomic work for them. All right? I think this is brilliant. In terms of quality, this is actually very good. Now, uh, while we were working on the project, uh, there are some areas that we feel that require improvements. Two areas in terms of biodiversity data management that requires improvement are, number one, the development of a taxonomic backbone. And number two, um, a, a fairly robust biodiversity analytics system. We're not talking about statistics. We're talking about analytics, right? Similar to the Google Analytics, but now focus on biodiversity uh, in information. Uh, let's look at the bio, uh, the taxonomic backbone, uh, something that we need to really look into. The biodiversity uh, the, uh, taxonomic backbone that we are talking about is uh, basically a uh, establishment of a database reference system that is developed according to GBIF standards. I believe the alum is uh, has met this one. And uh, the next step is to uh, what is, uh, establish a taxonomic concept transfer schema, the TCS. The TCS is important because, as you know, uh, even like MyBees, all right, it's just a platform. It integrates many, di many different kinds of systems. Every collection uh, centers have their own database. So what we need is a schema that enables all these various different systems to talk to one another. So that when there's a, a data transfer, there's not, there are no hiccups, all right? So I think uh, in, uh, creating this uh, transfer concepts, and the, the schema itself is something that we have to look into, okay? And uh, this, this kind of transfer schema has to be scalable. We, we do not want to build a system that is bogged bog down with legacy issues that we can't scale up in future. Secondly, I think more importantly is the, the human capital aspect. All right, we need to strengthen relevant social expertise and information from five major community networks uh, on taxonomic indexing, all right, uh, with common nomenclatures or system designations. Uh, I think the area that we should look into, which, uh, the, which is based on the strength of an, our country's uh, biodiversity, uh, is like zoology, botany, marine biology, bioeta, mycology, and phycology. And uh, another area that we should look into is the integrating with existing expert networks, supporting Malaysian and possibly ASEAN checklist. I think we are doing this, but it's not really in an integrated way. 
Okay, we need to really improve on this aspect. And in, an important area that uh, we should uh, also explore is the inclusion of a focal point network in the formulation of operational standards. I do not think our country will have a dedicated bioinformatics uh, center, all right, advising and working together with the biologists in creating these operational standards. There's no full-time uh, bioinformatics uh, support in that aspect. We have IT experts coming in and out working with the biological experts, but not at a full-time aspect, all right? And uh, part of parcel of, uh, you know, helping up the um, biologists to be engaged with pub the public is uh, developing tools such as the e-curation and e-taxonomic platforms so that they can they're enabled to use technology to engage with public in, uh, in, in coming up with the uh, 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 systems that en enable to kind of like uh, integrate various uh, expertise networks. Uh, just now, um, uh, Dr. Yvonne Lim talked about, you know, uh, uh, how to uh, leverage on existing technology platforms to study, uh, to become uh, more efficient in handling zoonotic diseases. She mentioned about biological human capital and IT infrastructure. So basically, uh, the taxonomic backbone is about integrating bioinformatics and biological human capital. It is something that we need to strengthen for our country in facing things like, you know, uh, the COVID uh, virus situation and any other pandemic uh, diseases, diseases that could come out in the future. Okay. And finally, analytics. I believe uh, this is something that uh, we really need to do because despite, you know, collecting all this wonderful data, in the end, what do you want to do with it, right? What, how, do you, how do you get this uh, data in the hands of policymakers and the push of a button, they're able to come up with this wonderful uh, anal analysis that tells you this area is, uh, what God is, uh, is under threat. How do you get supporting data to describe that this area is under threat, right? So an, a good analytic system is required to, to come up with this uh, big picture uh, facility and help uh, policies, uh, policymakers and decision makers to understand better the data that is uh, being provided. Okay, so I think that's it for my presentation. I just made it on time. And I will pass back this, uh, to Dr. Liu, because I think from my presentation, uh, afterwards, I will hand it over to uh, Dr. Mr. Lawrence Livermore, who will be uh, able to advise further, all right, the work that is being done by the NHM, and they will collaborate with the findings that I've done, I've done so far. Thank you, Lim, for sharing your uh, expeditions. Thank you, thank you, Lim, uh, for sharing your expeditions to... It's quite an interesting background. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing with us your experience. I, and more important, I see quite a remarkable system you have set up, uh, the Alam project. Uh, not only the, 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 the project itself, so it's, it's very interesting, I think the acronym itself, ALAM, is very meaningful. So ladies and gentlemen, now come to our last panelist for this session. It's Mr. Lawrence Livermore. Lawrence is Innovation Project Manager with nearly 11 years of experience at the Natural History Museum. He is specialized in digitization, biodiversity informatics, and data. He holds a Master of Science in Entomology from Imperial College London and has a background in entomology. He is a subject editor for the Biodiversity Data Journal and Zotasa. He is currently managing the museum's digitization team and multiple digital innovation projects spanning science and information technology at the museums as part of the museum's digital collections program. So today, Mr. Lawrence will share with us his various open source systems and model that he has worked in managing the diverse data. So Lawrence, you may start your presentation now. Can you see my presentation? Yes, loud and clear. Great. Okay, thanks for inviting me to talk today. And thank you, Lillian and Lim, for describing the context of biodiversity data projects in Malaysia. I'll talk more generally about biodiversity data um, in terms of digitization and in the context of international collaboration. 
So my focus over the past six years or so has been predominantly the biodiversity diversity data associated with physically preserved specimens. But this work also extends and applies to things like biodiversity literature mining, observation records, sound recordings, tissue samples, and environmental DNA. Our museum is a bit like an iceberg. What you see in the public galleries is just a small glimpse of what we hold and what goes on behind the scenes. There are over 30,000 specimens on display, but we hold an estimated 80 million. Most natural science collections are enormous, not just in their sheer numbers, but in every conceivable dimension. Their taxonomic, geospatial, temporal, and even physical scale poses very specific challenges. And because of this, certain communities of practice have built up that can make digitization rather challenging. This is a busy slide, but what I want to emphasize is that managing digitization and biodiversity data is not just a single process, and it's certainly not just a technical one. This is an overview of the program and gives an insight into the different goals that help shape some of our projects and our thoughts. Yeah. When we got started, we were focused on pilot projects and quick wins, followed by running regular mass digitization projects. But it's important to note that digitization is not just a technology or a workflow. It's about what you do with the data and some of the stories you can tell and how they impact people and culture. And this is a more cultural take on that previous program overview. And again, I want to emphasize that managing biodiversity data is about what you do and how you act. If you expect your partner to openly share data, adopt and apply your policy proposals and use your technology, then you really need to be leading by example. So we usually work on a variety of projects and the Atlas of Living Malaysia was a new challenge for us in many ways. Lim has already discussed some of these challenges, including the need to compile reference species list for the Malaysian region. But it also required us to locate tax within our collections. And like many, these collections are not organized geographically. So the physical logistics of moving many hundreds of drawers around the um, from one part of the building to another, and the variety in size and complexity from very small specimens to large, some newer specimens to older specimens was quite challenging at times. And I'd also like to highlight one of the benefits of sharing data openly. Some of the leaf insects that we digitized, the phasmids, um, shortly after we completed the project, uh, there was a publication describing the range expansions and uh, descriptions of cryptic leaf mimic species. As leaf mimics, such as these, can live in um, higher treetop canopies, it can be very hard to get in situ observation records for them. So by using museum specimens, this publication highlights the importance of digitizing natural history collections to understand the natural world. But this discovery and the use of these specimens would not have been possible without our data portal. This is our in-house platform that acts as an access point for users who wish to search and download the museum scientific data. It hosts museum research data sets, as well as digitized items from the museum specimen collection. And that includes 3D scans, images, audio recordings, and other kinds of structured data. The portal currently hosts over 4.5 million specimen records and 168 research data sets, each of which get their own DOI. In terms of usage, for every visitor of our physical collections in London, over 10 visitors download data from our digital collections. And given the current pandemic we're all dealing with, I think it's an important reflection point about the value of digital data. Without our data portal, many of our scientists and external collaborators would have limited access to our collections and research data for many, many months. All of the data on the portal is CC0 and our images are under Creative Commons Attribution License. 
And what that means is that you can use any of our data for any purpose um, and you're not required to give us attribution, although of course we would encourage it and it's good practice for scientific research. And all of the code for the portal is open source. It's uh, written in Python and built on an open source platform called CCAN with all the code available in GitHub. But how do you go about making sure that your data is useful and ensure that it's used? So I think the FAIR principles are a good start when thinking about this. So ensuring that your data are find findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. But what are the kind of key considerations and things that you should be thinking about in terms of biodiversity data and research? So this has kind of got a, um, a biodiversity slant, but a lot of these principles apply to any kind of scientific research. For specimens and observations and occurrence data, you should be using unique and persistent identifiers such as GUIDs. Um, in physical collections, barcodes are particularly effective as well. So if you're going through doing mass digitization, I'd strongly uh, encourage using barcodes. For data sets and, and other kinds of data, DOIs, digital object identifiers, which many of you will have seen on um, journal articles are incredibly useful. And you can even get them for presentations and other kinds of academic outputs these days. Thinking of accessibility is important, um, especially both for machines and humans when designing um, e-platforms and ensuring that your data, that especially the data that underpins scientific research is in a trusted repository. And that includes your specimen records if you're using those for range expansions and modeling. Um, I've put a few examples of repositories that I've used along the top. In terms of interoperability and making use of existing standards and protocols, Lim has already mentioned Darwin Core. There's a few others, but that's a, a really good starting point to get familiar with and be thinking about. It's our de facto community standard. And finally, ensuring that you have an appropriate license and it's easy for people to understand how, how specimens and other content is licensed is really important. And this is just a kind of mixed overview of platform systems and standards that can improve um, findability, accessibility, interoperability and reusability. Um, I'd strongly encourage that you all consider getting an ORCID to enhance your discoverability and to help uniquely identify your outputs, both at traditional publications, data sets, presentations and other things. I've got a few examples of links in the presentation that you'll be able to see afterwards as well. So how do we go about um, collaborating and with who do we collaborate internationally? I want to talk about a few of our projects and our partners. So one of our key projects, NHM London, is Synthesis. This is a European Commission funded project with the aim to create an integrated European infrastructure for natural history collections. It is led by NHM London and has been running since about 2004 over four funding periods. We currently have 32 partner, partners across Europe and the United States. Um, and this is a kind of a broad list of some of the uh, products or outcomes that I think are particularly relevant to some of the work that you're planning in Malaysia. The majority of these products and research will be made publicly available and we are very happy to, to share these with you, our colleagues in Malaysia. Disco builds on the synthesis community with the aim to build a single European collection for natural science facilities. So while synthesis has 32 partners, um, DISCO now includes over 120 facilities. So it's this big movement towards a centralized government governance model in Europe, building a broader network of support groups working across many, many countries having um, shared R&D and facility development for mass collections digitization with the aim to really kind of leverage the kinds of economy of scale that can only be realized when you're working um, in such an ambitious way. In terms of scientific services, DISCO plans to develop um, uh, an online discovery and access tools along with 
um, analytical services for thinking about complex linked data, including molecular, genomic, chemical, geospatial and observation data as well as unified physical and remote access across all of these collections and supported by a comprehensive uh, training services to ensure our workforce and collection users have the skills required to deliver these services. And it may be a kind of model to consider if you're thinking about large scale collaboration. And finally, um, with GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, it's um, a big international network and research infrastructure funded by the world's governments and aims at providing anyone um, anywhere open access data about all types of life on Earth. I think these numbers give you an idea of its scale, both in participation and the technology required to deliver it. In addition to sharing occurrence data, GBIF also provides a comprehensive set of open access information resources and tools that will help you develop a national biodiversity information facility. And this also includes a set of tools that we find particularly useful, which helps, helps us understand how our data is being used in the wider world and its scientific impact. And Participation in GBIF also gives you access to a set of mentoring and training projects, funded programs, and can really help with regional collaborations and strategy development. So together, Synthesis, Disco and GBIF share a single vision that move towards one virtual international collection where all natural science collections are made available to everyone. And it is great to be working with our colleagues in Malaysia on this vision too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Uh, glad to see a lot of interesting projects. Uh, this disco that you have shared with us just now, and also the uh, GBIF uh, International Collaborations. And we have uh, the Deputy Director's team here with us. And definitely, I would say, uh, we are very looking forward to see, to see how we can explore the opportunity for a greater collaboration network. Okay, and I think we are now go for the Q and A sessions. I do have a question from uh, Mr. Muhammad Af, Af sorry Afzanizam. Sorry, I'm very bad at the uh, names. Okay, how do we protect our biodiversity data bank or the biodiversity repository to the cybersecurity threat? I think that's a good question, a concern from the data owner. And what is the extent of damage it has to our scientific community as a whole? Uh, I'm not sure uh, who wants to pick up that question. It's regarding the uh, potential cybersecurity threat. Um, I could have a start. Um, so uh, in terms of the threat, I would say re you really need to be thinking about what data um, you wouldn't want to look. So, you know, potentially threatened species data. But I think the majority of our biodiversity data, there isn't a huge threat about sharing it. Um, and we try and take a very pragmatic approach in deciding what to share. And that if you, if you kind of are sharing most of your stuff publicly and understand that there is no threat in sharing it, it makes it easier to deal with the data that you do need to Thank you, Lawrence. I, I think you also did mention example for the uh, natural muse history museums. A lot of data that share on the repository is made on the Creative Commons Zero uh, license, right? So mm -hmm. basically, the data itself is already uh, uh, made accessible and available for the public. Uh, maybe uh, for others' domain, we do have the questions. Yeah. Yes, Lillian. Uh Yes, I concur with what Lawrence has said. We need to be pragmatic. Uh, only a small portion of our city is actually under threat. So yes, I do. I do fully concur. Uh, what do you call uh, the way the Natural History Museum is doing it? Yes, exactly. We do have for those threatened species. We do actually provide some information, but these are rather general and uh, information that are already available in the public domain. Now, of course, you know that a lot of scientific literature also provides when they publish their scientific, when they, uh, when they publish their articles, you know, the information also resides there. So there are other avenues that I think uh, 
you all participants out there will know that you know the threats are also coming from those kind of avenues. Thank you very much. Yes, Lin. Uh, sorry, Lin, we can't hear you. Uh, can you unmute your mic? Okay, sorry. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes. I just, just kind of share my experience, you know, when I was at the uh, Sabah Research Center in Sepilok, all right? And I met up with all these scientists and uh, we talk about, you know, sharing information. But, you know, Sabah is a hotspot in uh, conservation, okay? And they are very wary about releasing information, especially on IUCN threatened species, okay? So, um, you know, basically they are saying that, you know, poachers, poachers don't, you know, the, the big, big, the big honchos, the head, head poachers, they are, they do not, they are not required to be at the site to collect the specimen. What they do is that they go to databases like what we are doing now, right? They locate the, the GPS location if the information is available and they make a phone call to the, uh, you know, the head, the head of the village around that area. And these villagers go and collect the data or the specimen, collect the specimen and, you know, they smuggle out of the country. So they are very, very worried about all this, this sort of, uh, you know, virtual ways of getting information. And that is why, you know, Sabah, then, uh, frankly, they told me, we are not going on board with all these virtual systems, you know, it's very dangerous. They have everything stored offline in their own databases. Okay. So I, I mean, I, I concur with Lawrence and uh, Lillian just now. He says, uh, any non-threatening uh, specimen we can publish. But those who are on the red list, ICU, IUCN red list, I think they, they want to stay away. Okay, but I don't think there's a big, there's a big, uh, you know, amount of uh, content to the red list. Generally, you know, we have a lot of other specimen that uh, we can share. And uh, I'm actually very impressed with the NHM portal. If I just, if you just let me show you what they have done, uh, the alarm one, uh, but fairly quickly, let me share the screen. Okay, so the, uh, one of the questions that the the worker is uh, just now the, the question the question relate was related to the uh, the uh, uh, worker is a threat in getting the old I mean uh, stealing content right now what have what when I when I presented my 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 slides just now we're talking about occurrence all right occurrence ID now every specimen is given a computer generated ID like this Do you see here occurrence ID right. And this ID here is related to the, the domain, the link of the particular specimen itself here, okay? And this particular ID is linked to the location and linked to the specific uh, scientific name of the specimen, okay? And also linked to the author who described the specimen. So I think I believe when we do when we uh, correlate the uh, occurrence of the specimen to the author describe the specimen and then establish the link through this uh, URL here, we can identify and link the specimen directly to the, the scientist to discover it or actually describe it, right? So in that sense, you know, we can actually uh, ascribe ownership to the person who, who identified the specimen. Uh, this this sort of structure, I think, is very useful, you know, in um, in giving a, a kind of like a recognition to the taxonomist or the scientist. What do you think, Lawrence? Do you want to add anything? In terms of recognition to scientists, I think that there are a few um, exciting platforms. Um, I mentioned uh, a very briefly one in the talk called Bionomia and um, how that works. It's why one of the reasons I encourage people to get an ORCID. Um, so this is your own personal unique identifier for academic outputs. There are systems now and we're hoping to adopt this in our collections that all aspects of kind of working with the collection, digitizing it, doing an identification, um, e collecting specimens, all of those would be associated with your ORCID. And I think in the talk, which I've made available online, I've put a few examples of Nomia, which used to be known as um, Bloodhound, kind of pulls 
puts all of that information together so you can see that academic work you've done on building a collection and working with a collection and i think incentivization and kind of doing attribution for effort is is very important um and helps with that kind of recognition because you know the specimens we see in in a collection you know these pinned insects preserved herbarium sheets that that represents many hours of work in the field and then you know uh, sorting out the specimen when you get back so yeah i think it's really important to recognize that effort from people who help us um, build these collections yeah yeah thank you Thank you, Lawrence and Lynn, for the comment. Yeah, I think we agree that the data is a valuable asset and the, one of the ways that make it more valuable actually is by sharing it and then use it. Of course, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, core data, Beijing's uh, declaration of research data management, we don't expect everything to be open. Okay, that is not a spirit of open science, but what we try to achieve is uh, as open as possible and as close as necessary. So for those uh, non-threatened uh, 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 data set, I think it's good that we make it uh, accessible and available. But of course, how to make sure that the entire process, as what uh, Lawrence mentioned here, following the FAIR principle, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And also we need to sort out the way how we can acknowledge and also attribute to the, uh, the ownerships of the, all the effort put in by the uh, data contributors. So those are very uh, good comments uh, from the panel here. Okay. The, I, I'm afraid that we don't have uh, uh, more time to entertain more questions here. Uh, it's already four o'clock now. Uh, there will be another interesting discussion after this. Uh, but I think uh, quite uh, all the panelists are quite agreed to uh, having a federated data platforms and looking into how, what is the possibilities of uh, integrating all the existing resources together, especially uh, mentioned the GPIF here. So I will say that uh, as the Malaysian Open Science perspective, uh, this is one of the big agenda that we uh, will put in, not only to encourage, including like provide the good support, like Lynn mentioned just now, uh, whether we have a supporting network for the biologists. I think not only for the biologists, but also others domain as well. And then second, whether we have an integrated platform that easily can be federated to the world uh, repository. So there will be the main uh, challenges for the, uh, I think all of us here, all the panels here, Okay, and also uh, for MSA perspective. So I think uh, that's all for this section. Uh, so I, once again, uh, please join me to thank our panelists, Lawrence, Lillian, and Lim uh, for the wonderful presentations and your time.